This has been been a busy week, a good week, a heart um, heartbreaking week in some ways. But God is good and busy, and, and and we're busy in all those things. You know, I just wanted to say this week, um, Donna and I just in preparation of Sam and Judy moving. They moved into their their new place this weekend. In preparation for that, we installed another laminate floor. And I don't mean to brag, but we're getting pretty okay at that. I think that was the seventh floor, that laminate floor that we have installed together. And we just, we work pretty well as a team and and it turned out okay. But uh, just thinking, you know, as we do that, it seems like in all of those projects that we've done, we we come to a place in installing those floors where there's a cut that is tricky. And, and it's not just a one cut, it's a multiple cuts where you're going around a corner or, or there's a nook or there's an odd angle and you have to make those cuts. And it just seems like every time when I do that, I, 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 I measure it and I, I think about it and I try to visualize it and then I measure it and I draw it out and then I measure it again and change my drawing out and then I mark it and I measure it again and then I make the cut and it's wrong. I come out two inches short, and I think, how did that happen? It shouldn't have been like that. I had it all figured out. It shouldn't have been there, and I I realized I cut the wrong side of the board. And it didn't work out the way I had done it. Now, I I don't mean to, you know, become over-philosophical about wrong cuts on my laminate floor, but just realize life is like that sometimes, isn't it? When you measure and you plan and you draw it out and you visualize it and then you go and it doesn't turn out anything like what you had visualized. You say, it wasn't supposed to be like that. Often some, well, often in life it, it turns out that way. And, and often in life, in, in life we look at what happens and we say, you know, that just didn't make sense. Because that's not the way it should have been. That's not the way I had it planned. That's not the way I had it measured. And it doesn't make sense that it turned out differently. Really, that's what, uh, what we're looking at this morning in Ecclesiastes. As Solomon, writing, he puts himself in the narrative as the preacher, he comes to a couple instances in life where he says, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Here's what I see, and here's what I've observed, and in reality, it just doesn't fit with the plan, and it doesn't make sense. We want to open the Word of God this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, as we, we look at these things, and it's, it's the things that don't make sense that sometimes add to that turmoil in our life to say, yeah, where is the meaning of life? It doesn't make sense, and, and we're missing that meaning. I, I want to pull this over because I want to look at this scripture in a couple different references, a couple couple of different translations. And so, here we go. Because the first thing we notice, we're in chapter 8, we're going to start about verse 10. And it's interesting that as we read this, if you're not reading from New American Standard, you'll, you'll see that there are some words that are different. And it's interesting in these difference of this variation of translation that the words are quite different. In, in fact, they're startlingly different, and it's hard to understand how we could get two different ideas and two different directions from the same scripture. Here's how it reads in New American Standard, starting at verse 10. So then I, I've seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out of the holy place, And they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility. Now, how many had a translation that didn't sound anything like that? Let me read it. Here's another translation. This is the NET, or the New English Translation, and I'm liking this translation more and more. This comes out of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I like the online version, the digital version, because there's a lot of footnotes and explanations, and you click on those, and it's like having your Bible open with really extensive study notes right there. But it reads really differently here. And as we read this, well, let's just take a look. Here's here's how it reads in the NET. Not only that, but I have seen the wicked approaching and entering the temple. And as they left the temple, they boasted in the city that they had done so. This also is an enigma. 
So right away we see this variation of translation and, and a couple different words that are different here. In New American Standard, it says, I've seen them buried. In the NET, it says, I've seen them approaching. So how do those two come together? Throw that, those words up on the slide, Joe. A and then it, at the end of that verse, we also see some more variations. At the end of the verse, in verse 10, New American Standard, it says, They came in and out of the holy place, and they are soon forgotten. I, so let's read the whole verse. And then I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out of the holy place, and they were soon forgotten in the city where they had done so. So we've got that word forgotten. In the NET, it reads this way. Not only that, I've seen the wicked approaching and entering the temple, and as they left the temple, they boasted in the city that they had done so. This is an enigma, he says. So we, we, in one translation, it says they were forgotten. In another translation, it says they boasted. And then we add to that, if you're reading NIV, it said they were praised when they came through. So I'm thinking that's, that's quite a difference. A lot of times when we have differences in translations, we can kind of piece that together and understand why one word was used instead of another word, and, and we get the meaning. But this one, it just seems like, well, that's really different, that I've seen them approach or I've seen them buried. Which one is it? And, and, and then they, they were soon forgotten, or they boasted, or they were praised. How does that fit together, and how do those, those pieces fit together? So I dug into that, and I really got serious about studying and got all, all my big reference books and had them stacked on my desk because that looks really impressive when I've got all those books spread out on my desk. And I looked in and, and, and studied and read about it until my eyes glazed over because I have no idea. Three, three contributing factors. This is what I do understand about this, just these contributing factors. And, and one of the contributing factors is that it just has to do with the nuance of an ancient language. It's the nuances of the Hebrew language. And, and with a lot of languages, voice inflection makes a difference and how that voice inflection is translated or written down in, in that script form, and it could make a difference from one word or the other. And then it's an ancient language that has morphed and changed through time. Another explanation is is that uh, it's just the readability of ancient texts. And, you know, those just little jot and tittles that, that are, are there and the readability of that text. And then the third explanation simply is this, that, that Solomon is writing in this literary form. It's poetry that he's writing. And there are word pictures that he's creating here. He's, he's creating just this scene for us and just understanding what he's saying. And all those things contribute to say, boy, we could, we could look at this two different ways. But the truth is, even with those differences, and they read quite differently in these two translations, the NET again says this, not only this, but I've also seen the wicked approaching and enter the temple, and as they left the holy place, they boasted in the city that they had done so. He said, this is an enigma. New American Standard reads differently. And so then I have seen the wicked buried. Those who used to go in and out of the holy place, and they were soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This is futility. Two, two thoughts here. Two word pictures. But I think they come to the same ultimate conclusion. Here's the word picture. Here's how I would paraphrase that. From the NET, this is what he has observed. That the wicked approach the temple. They have no business being in the temple in their wicked condition. They go in and they leave the temple and they, they boast about it, that they were in the temple and you know what? It was no big deal. Nothing ever happened to them. God didn't care. God didn't care about their actions or their attitude. God didn't care about the condition of their life and they boast about it that nothing happened to them. They went into the holy place and nothing happened to them. Kind of the same idea when we come back to the New American Standard. That the preacher says, I've seen this. That those people who were buried, I've seen them buried. But they used to go in and out of the temple. And then they eventually died and they're buried and they're forgotten like nothing ever happened. And in both cases, there's kind of that, that question that, that 
God didn't hold them accountable to that. God withheld that retribution. He didn't pay them back, so to speak, for their wicked action. He said, this is, this is not right. That those who are flaunting their wickedness, flaunting their immorality, flaunting their rebellion against God, even in the temple, and nothing seemed to happen to them. It's not right. By the way, when you think about that scenario, I think we see that more and more all the time. Hopefully not here, but in, in churches and denominations that once were very solid in preaching the word of God, just becoming more and more lax about a standard of morality and, and congratulating themselves on being loving and inclusive to everybody regardless of how they're living their life according to their sexual morality, according to their sexual identity. And we say, oh, it's all good, it's all good. And they come in and out of that worship setting and say, nothing ever happened. So obviously God is accepting of where we are. And they congratulate themselves and they're praised for it. And, and they justify that by saying, nothing ever happens. Well, the preacher goes on to explain one of the contributing factors. Look at verse 11 with me. He, here's why this happens. Here's why the, the wicked go in and out of the temple and nothing ever happens and they become more and more bored, bold. Here's why. Verse 11. Because the sentence against the evil deeds is not executed quickly. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Here's, here's a principle. And any 10-year-old boy who's thrown rocks at a wasp nest, understands this principle. I may or may not have done that in my life. But you understand the principle. And, and I'll just say it this way. Um, I wrote it down so I would remember this. Um, the principle is this. The longer that you get away with stupidity, the more bold you become in being stupid. Right? Isn't that true? The longer you go... The longer you get away with your stupidity without harm, the more bold you become in being stupid. And so you just picture that 10-year-old boy who will remain nameless, who would throw rocks at a wasp nest, and the first one's really quite thrilling, and nothing happened. And you pick up another rock, and you throw it, and nothing happened. And then you become more and more, bo more, and more bold in doing something stupid because there's no repercussion until there is repercussion. And then you run like mad. But doesn't that explain? Doesn't that explain that sinful attitude that the longer we go without the repercussion of sin, the more bold we become in sinning? And that kind of explains what, what the preacher is saying here, what Solomon is saying here. That they go in and out of the temple and they become more and more bold in their rebellion against God and their open rejection of the standards of God. And they come in and out of the temple and say, look, nothing ever happens. And the conclusion of the preacher, Solomon, says, you know, this, this is one of those enigmas this is one of those things that are is futile this is one of those things that is hevel it doesn't make sense that nothing ever happens and he's trying to wrestle that together with what he knows to be true and this is what he observes we kind of see that wrestling in the next verse look at verse 12 with me Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well with the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear the Lord. So he, here's the wrestling that he comes to. He says, here's what I observe, and the wicked become more and more bold in their wickedness, and yet I know. I still know that this is true, that in the end, the one who is better off is not the one who is bold in his wickedness. Still, I know that in the end, it goes better for the one who fears God. And he's trying to wrestle that, wrestle that to the ground. Now, I, I want to stop there and just pause over this, this statement. Verse 12 
says, although the sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his days, still I know that it will, it will be well for those who fear God, who fear openly before him. What does that mean? What does that mean to fear God? Now, part of our inclination, I don't know why this is, but part of our inclination is to soften that word. To soften that idea, we must not make it say less than it says. But our inclination is to soften it. And, and part of that inclination is say, well, we know this to be true about God, that God is a loving God, that God is love. John tells us that very thing, that very statement. He who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. We know that God is rich in mercy. We know that he's abundant in loving kindness. We know that he's the giver of every good gifts. We know that his heart is tender towards us. And all of those things are absolutely true. But we try to wrestle that with this idea that, yeah, but we fear him. And so we try to make that maybe seem or sound something less than it is. And we say, well, it doesn't mean fear. We try to make it say, well, it, mean, it means respect. It means to reverence God. It doesn't mean to fear, to be afraid of him. It just means that we reverence him. And, and we should reverence him. We should give him that ultimate respect. But I don't think that's what that word means, especially here. I think it means to be afraid. See, one of the ways we understand what that word is is we look to see how that is used in other contexts, in especially the Old Testament. The word that we would see here in Hebrew is yare. We transliterate it Y-A-R-E, yare. And, and we look to see how that word is used in different contexts. Let, let me give you a couple of examples. Exodus in chapter 34, verse 30. And this is the portion of Scripture where Moses has just been up on the mountain. Sinai had been in the presence of the Lord. And he comes down out of the mountain and his face is shining because he's been in the presence of the Lord. And it says that the people were afraid of him because his face was shining. It's the same word, yare, that, that he, he, they, were, they were afraid of him. Now, if we tried to put in that other definition of fear doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense to, to try to make this say, and he came down out of the mountain and his face was shining and they gave him ultimate respect. They gave him reverence. It really isn't what that means, is it? It's not that they respected him. They didn't want to come close to him because they respected him so much. They didn't want to come close because they were afraid. It was scary the way he looked. And it was so unnatural, and it was so overwhelming because they recognized the holiness of God in there. They didn't want to come close to him, not out of reverence, but out of fear. The same way, give, let me give you another example. Joshua. This is Joshua chapter 11, verse 6. And this is Joshua leading the people of Israel in claiming the land that God had promised them. This is the process of taking control and conquering the land. And there's one point where... Joshua and the people of Israel are coming up against an alliance of kings who have gathered themselves to oppose Israel, and this is an impressive alliance of kings. And Joshua in his leadership and Joshua in the nation of Israel are hesitating a little bit. Why? Because it's an overwhelming force, and they are afraid. And to that, God says, do not be afraid. Now, do we plug in that other definition? Does God say, do not be in reverence of them. He's not saying do not give them ultimate respect. He's saying just don't be afraid. Don't hesitate. Don't cower to this. Don't let your knees buckle at this because I am with you. Don't be afraid. I'll give you another reference. It's Jeremiah in chapter 5, verse 22. And, and again, it's kind of that same idea where God is speaking to his people through the prophet and he says do not Fear, same word, yare. Do not fear. And then in the next statement, he says, or tremble. Well, actually, he says it. Let me, let me back up there. He, he makes it as a statement to them. Do you not fear me? Do you not tremble? So he's asking that as a question. Do you not fear me? And it's not, do you not give me respect? 
or do you not reverence me? He says, do you not fear me? And we know he's talking about fear because the next thing he says, do you not tremble before me? This is what happens when you fear. You tremble before him. So we plug that back in here. As Solomon says, I know that it won't go well for the wicked, but it does go well for those who fear me. So what does it mean to fear? I think this is really an important thing for us to grab a hold of. As I looked at this and kind of tried to make sure I understood it correctly, I wrote down this definition. I I just want to read the definition for you. To fear the Lord. You can write some of this down. You don't have to try to write all of it down. To fear the Lord is to have a right assessment of who he is, of his, of his power, of his holiness, a right assessment of his hatred of sin, a, a right assessment of his limitlessness in every aspect of his being. In other words, everything he is, he is without limit. And if we could get a picture of that, that would probably scare us. We'd be afraid of that. We dare not encroach to handle as holy or even acceptable what he has called unholy. We dare not think that we could resist or withstand his wrath or escape his notice or his judgment. To fear the Lord is to come to the full realization that he is holy and we are not. And I've said that many, many times. The most terrifying moment in human existence is to come to that realization and realize that you've never done anything about that great gap of his holiness and our unholiness. And in that, we are completely unworthy to stand or even kneel in his presence. In that little box on your uh, note page, write this down. To fear the Lord is to know that we are in desperate need of his extended mercy. We are in desperate need of his extended mercy. And you know what? That's actually a pretty good place to be. Kind of similar to the statement that we see in the New Testament. Jesus, in the portion of Scripture we call the Sermon on the Mount, specifically the Beatitudes, One of those, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And when he says poor in spirit, he doesn't mean that you're you're spiritually lacking. It just means you're spiritually destitute. You've got nothing spiritually. That's a good place to be to realize that spiritually you've got nothing to offer to God. It's a good place to be, as the preacher says, to recognize that you are in desperate need of his mercy because without it, you are condemned. And that's a fearful place to be. But it's a good place to be to recognize that because that's the place that we come to when we embrace Jesus as Savior. That full understanding that I need his mercy and there's nothing in me that makes me acceptable or lovable to God. There's nothing in me that minimizes his wrath upon me because of my rebellion against him. There's nothing except for his mercy extended. And when we come to that, we, ex- we embrace what took place at the cross with the whole heart. And so the preacher says, boy, I know. It goes much better for those who stand in fear of God. And don't make that word less than it is. Because that's a powerful word. Here's another thing. Moving on. Uh, another frustration We see it in verse 14 now. There is a futility which is done on earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And on the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say this too is futility. This is another thing that's frustrating. This is another thing that just doesn't turn out. It doesn't make sense when you see the wicked and And the sense that there's no retribution. They they get repaid as if they were righteous. What's up with that? And then there are righteous people who who suffer like the wicked should. Wicked seem to prosper. And that's contrary to what we've got it figured out to be. 
As we think about life and, and have it all measured out and calculated and drawn out, nowhere in our plans do we say, well, you know, the wicked should, should be better off. I don't know if it's because if I say, as I've said before, that I grew up as the last of the black and white TV generation, kind of these ideas of right and wrong and justice and the way it should be. In my mind and in my thinking, uh, the good guy always wins, right? The guy in the white hat always win. Cheaters never prosper. You ever hear that? Cheaters never prosper. Crime does not pay. Sometimes it does. And that's never in my plan. It doesn't figure in to that thinking, and it's frustrating. And the reality is that sometimes the wicked do prosper. And they prosper really well. And the frustrating thing is sometimes that the righteous suffer. And we wonder, why is that? Well, you know what? The world is messed up. The world is way messed up. And it's, it's not just that sometimes those righteous people die way too soon. And you wonder why that's so. How could, how could God, in his goodness and his love and his mercy, call someone young and, and good? Call them from this life? And, and how is it that the wicked and the immor, immor, immoral, I was going to say immortal, but the immoral, just keep going and keep going and keep going. How is that? And, and then sometimes in this messed up world, we, we realize that those who stand up for righteousness are vilified and attacked and accused, while those who are immoral, immor, that word, that they're held up as heroes and praised. And Solomon says, I've seen this and it's frustrating, and it doesn't make sense. So here's his conclusion. We want to look at this quickly, but look at it carefully. Here's his conclusion. We, we read it in verse 15. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink and be merry. And this will stand by him in his toil throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. Here's the conclusion. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, let's understand that correctly. He is, not, he is not commending, he is not endorsing that excessive indulgence. This is not hedonism. He's not saying that, that life is futile and it's empty and there's nothing beyond, and so there is no eternity, so just make the most of you can now and go ahead and eat and drink and be merry because that's all you got. That's not what he's saying at all. And he's not endorsing excess. But we understand it this way. It's a simple statement, but it makes a lot of sense. To enjoy each day to its fullest as a gift from God. That each day, God is gifting you with another day. And you enjoy what God has brought to you as a gift from him. And we understand that we can get so caught up in wishing that we had what we don't have. In, in hoping that that next possession or that next experience or that next achievement will bring fullness and meaning to life that we forget to enjoy what God has brought to us today. So he's saying, enjoy what God has brought to you today. Whether it's a lot, whether it's a little, just eat and drink and enjoy what God has given to you today and just understand that that's a gift from his hand. We can also get so caught up on the other side to, to mourn and lament the, the wickedness and the evil of this world and just to be so upset about that that we forget that in the midst of that, God is still God and he's still good. So enjoy his goodness in your life every day and be purposeful about enjoying his goodness, even in the, fact, in the midst of the fact that we live in a messed up world. And then this, and this is kind of the concluding thought, don't assume that you've got God figured out. It's part of the frustration. We, we say life doesn't make sense. It didn't work out the way I thought it should work out. I had it measured. I had it calculated. I had it drawn out, and it didn't turn out anything like that. And, and there's frustration. We think it, it didn't work out that way, and it's futility. But we can't assume that we've, we know what God is going to do. God doesn't always do what we think he should do. Look at verse 16. When I gave my heart 
to know and to see the task which has been done on the earth. Even though one should never sleep day or night, I saw every work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though a man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. Even though a wise man should say, I know, he has not discovered it. God doesn't have to work the way we think he must work. And to paraphrase here, you could spend all your time, day and night, you could never sleep trying to figure out God and what he must do and what he's going to do. You could spend all of your time, day and night, trying to figure that out, and you wouldn't figure it out. And if some wise guy says, I've got God all figured out, he hasn't. Here's the lesson. Sometimes you just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Sometimes you just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And why do the wicked seem to prosper and God doesn't do anything about it? Sometimes you just have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And when the righteous suffer, and that doesn't seem right, and where is God in the midst of that suffering? Sometimes you just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Pretty important principles here. It's interesting that we... We looked at these two principles in, in our Sunday school classes. We were going through Habakkuk, which is my way to say it. There, there was controversy in the Sunday school class, how to say that guy's name. We'll review that for you later. Two important principles. God is not limited to our understanding, even when our understanding is essentially correct. God's not limited to that. And the second principle, I don't even remember what it was. Sometimes we just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And when we, when we can rest there, we can rest on the nature and the character and the goodness of God, then these things we can put into perspective. And we don't find our fullness and satisfaction in the circumstances of our life. And that fullness and satisfaction that the preacher Solomon is, is striving for is not in everything working out the way he thinks it should work out. That fullness and satisfaction is enjoying the person of God and enjoying the gift that he's given day by day. And of course, all of that for us is centered on the person of Christ and the cross. You know, if you're looking for that satisfaction in any other source, any other foundation, you will be disappointed. And you'll find that that striving comes up empty-handed, like grabbing after smoke, after a vapor. But when your life is centered on Christ, then we know there is substance there. Center your life on Christ. If you've never embraced him as Savior, I need to talk to you to show you how you can know that foundation and put everything in perspective in Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We're amazed at the just the, the reality, the applicableness of your word that just speaks to our lives. We would pray that we would be the people collectively and individually who are centered on Christ, that we don't look to things or possessions or achievements to, uh, to bring us meaning and satisfaction but we look to Christ. And in that, this crazy, messed up world 